Waters with your host, Bud Levitt. To get it. Well, you know, it's a good time to talk to Fisheries and Wildlife Commissioner William Vale. It's been a year or so since he's been on here, and uh, lots happened in Fisheries and Wildlife over a year. Uh, uh, beginning to show the wear and tear of the job, too. The little gray, I notice, on the side here. A little different than your days when you were down in Hancock <laughs> County. That's right. Huh? <laughs> what little hair I've got left is turning white on me. It's turning white? Yeah. <laughs> been quite a year. It has been. The, the last four years have been quite an experience, but the last year in particular has been a tough one. What, have, what in the last four years has been the thing that's the most revealing to you? I mean, the most, uh, shall we say, surprising about the manage the, this job of managing our wildlife resources? Uh, what single thing uh, uh, that you come up against that you never expected? I think the involvement uh, of all of Maine's people in the process. For years it was the hunters and fishermen who dealt with these issues. That's no longer the case at all. And, and people from all walks of life are beginning to express their, their strong interest in terms of the future of fish and wildlife in Maine. <clears throat> and our involvement in, in issues uh, other than hunting and fishing like hydro relicensing and that sort of thing that very frankly I had no idea that I'd be, be dealing with. So it, <clears throat> I, I guess the, the, the scope of the job and the, and the scope of the issues is much broader than hunting and fishing, and that's what's uh, been the, the biggest eye-opener to me. Well, Bill, didn't you suspect that this was the case when you were in the field as a game warden, that you could see this uh, evolution changing before your eyes? Oh, I, I saw it then. I, I just didn't, I never imagined it would happen as soon as it has. Uh, here in Maine, you tend to view Maine as at, at the end of the road. And we can see changes in southern New England, but we don't really like to think that they're going to occur here in Maine, when very frankly they are occurring at an alarming rate here in Maine. Do you know when I first detected it, and maybe I'm wrong, but see if this gels with your thinking. When we had the uh, outbreak, interest, uh, outbreak in the interest in canoeing, back about 15 years ago, uh, suddenly, you know, a canoe was, has been uh, a form of vehicle on water here as long as we've lived around here, uh, from birch bark days all the way to the Old Down Canoe Company, White Canoe or whatever. But about 15 years ago, everybody got in a canoe, and then there were canoe races, like I think of the Kanduskeg, uh, uh, Sour Daps of Cook, and St. Croix, and all the rest of them. But I've always felt that when people suddenly get into a canoe and saw that this was not a lethal weapon and it can be a safe form of passage mm -hmm. in the hands of real people, a lot of people get into it and now uh, uh, seemingly uh, every fourth car you see in the road has got a canoe on the roof, right? I, th I think a canoe is a good barometer of, of interest in the outer doors uh, and the, certainly the sales of canoes have increased. Uh, from my point of view, uh, listening to what you had to say, I think you're exactly right. It used to be when you saw a canoe, there was either a shotgun or a fly rod in it. Right. Or uh, going back even a few years, maybe a set of steel traps were in it. You know, trappers and hunters and fishermen use canoes. Now, uh, the majority of canoeists aren't hunting or fishing or no. trapping. They're out there enjoying uh, Maine for other reasons. And there are a great many more of those folks frankly, than there are hunters and fishermen. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that, because I always figured from that, you know, I always said Earth Day was the greatest thing that ever happened to uh, uh, conservation and bringing attention to our resources and so forth. But then followed the great interest in uh, canoeing. Uh, and it was statewide. You could almost see it expand. And uh, in the old days, you'd go to, a, you'd see the uh, front of a uh, sporting goods shop, and he might have a couple of canoes there. Now it's not at all surprising to go by that same shop, and he's got 10 or 15 sure. hanging up on a rack where people make their choices. And uh, 
It introduced a lot of people to our streams and to our rivers and to our brooks and our back country and our wetlands and uh, suddenly they were being used by bird watchers. I don't mean to carry on here and you're taking time from you, but uh, uh, canoers, picnickers, uh, explorers and uh, photographers, uh, they all got in a canoe. That's right. And, uh, and another real positive side of that, although I think it's probably all positive, is, is those are generally non-consumptive users of the resource. They're out there enjoying Maine's fish and wildlife resource. They're not actually consuming it. They're not, they're not catching a trout. They're not shooting a deer. But at the same time, they're, they're developing a real understanding and a real affection for Maine's fish and wildlife, which I think will stand us in very good stead over the next decade as we begin to, to look at the future management of fish and wildlife, because now we have a whole new constituency out there who are legitimately concerned about the future of Maine's fish and wildlife. And it isn't just the hunters and fishermen anymore who are concerned about this. I think the controversy over Big A is another example. And whitewater rafting. Whitewater rafting introduced tens of thousands of people mm -hmm. to the Penobscot and the Kennebec River. Mm -hmm. And those folks are all now advocates for a clean environment and, and advocates for the renewable resources that we have here in Maine and they're real proponents of the state of Maine. So I think it's, it's very, very positive. And, and again, it's not just the hunters and fishermen out there anymore. Um, technology. How are we going to cope with technology? Now I'm thinking, you know, here we are in the ice fishing season, see? Uh, we have power augers now that can drill a hole uh, 30 inches of ice in 30 seconds, let's mm. say. Uh, we've got snowmobiles. Uh, We've got the finest, we've got tents, we've got uh, warming apparatus, we've got the finest clothes that uh, uh, technology can produce in the market. Uh, in the summertime, we've got outriggers, downriggers, uh, we've got Lorenz uh, equipment, we've got everything in the world to catch a fish. Mm. Uh, and on top of that, more leisure time than we've ever and had And we before. have more time than ever before to participate. Uh, how do you cope with that? Well, the only tool we have, uh, of course, is regulation and trying to maintain a quality fishing experience for more people every year is, is you know, becoming more challenging every year. Uh, and so we, we have to find ourselves making more restrictive regulations every year and going from five fish to two fish on some lakes or going down to one fish or in some cases no fish at all. Uh, and it's, it's because of a, of a combination of changes like you've just mentioned and more leisure time, better equipment, and frankly, fishermen are a lot more knowledgeable today than they used to be, mm -hmm. thanks to folks like yourself and others. Have, you can turn on the TV on a Sunday morning and learn about bass fishing or trout fishing on television now. So people are, are better educated and better equipped than ever before, and there's more of them than ever before, and the backcountry is more accessible than it's ever been. And so we have to look at ways of maintaining a quality fishing experience for more people. And, and truthfully, that comes down to stricter regulation. Well, yeah, but now we're saying the legislature is in session right now, see? You're beholden to the legislature, right? Uh, but isn't it more important than that? Uh, shouldn't you be empowered or shouldn't the commissioner be empowered to say uh, what we can and what we can't do? It's all regulation. I mean, just because you put it in the law book and you reduce the catch from mm -hmm. uh, five fish to two fish or any combination or whatever and so forth, uh, won't it be too late? Uh, isn't technology advancing ahead of our laws? Hasn't it already passed our laws? <clears throat> I don't think that it, I don't think that's necessarily true. You don't? You and I both recognize that a fish finder doesn't catch the fish for you. Certainly power augers have had some real impact on ice fishing because it, the fishermen are able to fish a lot longer and cover more water than they used to before. I don't see the power auger as the problem. Uh, I see fishing pressure as the problem. I don't see the fish finder as a problem. I think we can kind of get uh, get pretty elitist about this sometimes, and it'd be down, you know, if you and I had our way, probably be fly fishing only everywhere. But I don't think it's fair of me as commissioner or you as a as a journalist uh, to impose our values on all all people. I think if they yeah, choose, yeah, but it could be too late. Before. I don't think so, but I think that we can react with regulations. I have emergency powers. Uh, if because of, of technology and more fishing pressure, for instance, the west branch of the Penobscot is threatened by overfishing, I have the authority now to shut it down. I have the emergency powers to do that. Yeah. And, and we can shut it down and then uh, try to develop a more reasonable regulation. I think we have the tools there now. I went, I went uh, uh, and before, uh, I, got, I got to keep going on this because I'm going to ask you a tough question here in a minute. But, but anyway, 
I went macro fishing this summer with a great, great man, a friend of mine, two friends of mine. And we were fishing Penobscot Bay, and he's got the depth finder on there and so forth. Now, all my macro fishing was done in a dory in a rowboat at East Blue Hill down there and put off at Long Island and found a school of fish, and we, you know, we hand lined them in and put them in a pail, and that was the end for the day. And now we're in this great boat. He's got a fish finder and everything. Oh, throw it over here, bud. And of course, we get two, three, and four. Uh, even the poor little mackerel with millions and millions of them out there doesn't have a chance with his today's equipment. <laughs> and I'm not even going to mention who, yeah. and I'm sure he's watching, and uh, Captain Ed, I'm just picking on you. But yeah. anyway, uh, isn't that carrying a little too far? <laughs> well, it isn't for me, I guess. Uh, if, if a guy wants to use a fish finder to find mackerel... Uh, but, you know, mackerel, we have millions and billions, yeah. I guess, of those things up on the Atlantic coast. Well, we hope that we have. I'm not sure that we know all we need to know about mackerel or a lot of, of other fish. But, uh, again, if, if overfishing uh, begins to threaten a population, whether it's mackerel or brook trout, then we have the we have the legal tools to deal yeah. with that, and, okay. and uh, frankly, I'm opposed to to uh, making regulation changes to address specific pieces of equipment. Uh, I, I think we have a better tool available than that. All right, I'm going to ask you. Them. <laughs> I say this was a terrible lake fishing year, based on talking to an awful lot of people, uh, and that goes from Sebago all the way up to. Uh, Long Lake and Upper Rustic, mm -hmm. Square Lake and East Grand, Moosehead and all of them in between. Every man that I, every person that I ran into said he had a good year lake fishing. I certainly talked to 25 who said it was the poorest year they ever had. Do you think our lake fishing is uh, slacking off? Some of them have. Uh, you mentioned Moosehead. There's no question that the, the fishery at Moosehead isn't doing as well as we'd like to have it. But you also mentioned Long Lake up in Rustic County, uh, which had fabulous fishing this year. Some of the best landlocked fishing that we've ever seen uh, came out of Long Lake and, that, and the Fish River chain this spring. Sebago was not all that bleak. There was some real nice fish taken at Sebago. Sebago was a good example where we're trying to provide a quality fishery for thousands of people. And it, begins, uh, that's right. it gets to be very, very difficult there. But I think generally, Bud, I would agree, this was not a spectacular uh, some of the fish, especially on the big lakes. I think uh, trout fishing generally held up pretty well on the smaller trout ponds, but the big lakes uh, were not uh, outstanding this year by any means. And you don't believe in resting the lake for a complete year? We've tried it, Bud. We've tried it with small trout ponds. Uh, where I mean we, the big lakes. Yeah. The, the trouble is, the first year you open it up, you focus an awful lot of attention on it because the assumption is it's going to be that much better. And, and generally, what we've learned through this process is that we focus so much attention in, in the year that we open it up that we lose all the ground we gain during the closure. So it hasn't been especially uh, productive for us to try that. Yeah, but you're talking about small ponds yeah. like Johnson Pond, and I mm. can name a half a dozen of them as well as you can. Yeah. But uh, I mean, how many, how many more, many more people can invade Moosehead Lake in a single day if you close it for one year and close it off to ice station and say a year later? Now, I got everybody in Greenville mad at me and say, what's he saying? Say, Better but, you than me. I know that. I know what you're thinking. But, <laughs> uh, but you rest it from ice fishing, you rest it from summer fishing, and uh, let the planning program continue on and give it a year's rest. Uh, it, might have some, it might have some promise. Uh, Let's, let's talk about Moosehead for a minute. There is criticism that ice fishing is, uh, is reducing the open water fishermen's opportunity. They've taken well. too many through the ice and there's nothing left for us when we go up there in the spring. <clears throat> My role as commissioner, I've got to balance the two. Right. Uh, the ice fishermen are buying their license. They have an expectation for, for a good fishing experience No as right well. to discriminate against That's them. right. So if we're going to make reductions, it's got to be even across the board. And the best way to do that, in my view, anyway, is, is a reduced bag limit. Not necessarily an outright closure, a reduced bag limit. Uh, we can, fishing is unique, and we can't do this with deer hunting, but with fishing, we can provide the, the experience. We can enjoy the fishing experience without killing the fish. And, and, uh, and catch and release certainly is, is where the state of Maine 
over the next decade will begin to move, I think. A lot of other states have had great success with it. It, it isn't appropriate on all the waters in the state, but there are some waters in the state where catch and release may be the only real answer to maintaining a quality fishing experience. That's not, I'm not proposing that for Moosehead Lake, but mm -hmm. rather than an outright closure, mm -hmm. uh, a reduced bag limit or even fish for fun, perhaps. All right, come off and fish. Why the moose season in such an early date? There was uh, strong support among the Advisory Council and among uh, some moose hunters to go back to September, which is where we had it originally. The first three seasons were in September because that's what has gone on in some of the neighboring can Canadian provinces and the thought being to have the hunt centered on the, on the peak of the rut when the animals were at their peak condition and when the bulls would be most susceptible to a call. Uh, so that's why we had the, the September season early on. We eventually moved it into October and, uh, and for the last three or four years had, to, had the season in late October. <clears throat> the success rate was high, continued to be higher, uh, you know, approaching 93 percent there one year. Uh, but the quality of, of, the, of, the, of the animal and the quality of the hunt, there was some criticism that that declined because uh, these big bull moose, the big trophy bulls, will actually run off two to three hundred pounds in a month's time during the mating season. Uh, and they don't come to the call well in late October. So there was a, uh, a strong sense that we should go back to September to get animals uh, when they're at the peak of their condition and when we could provide a, a real quality hunt when the bulls would come to a call. So last year we had a public hearing. It was very poorly attended. Twelve people attended. Ten favored a September hunt. Uh, there was strong support on the Advisory Council for going back to September. And keep in mind that biologically it didn't make any difference to us as managers. It's a social question. Biologically, if you're going to issue a thousand permits, uh, it doesn't make any difference if it's mid-September, mid-October, or, or early December. If, if the object is to issue a thousand permits and take a thousand animals, when you have it really is more social than biological. So we had no real strong concern that way biologically. Uh, like I mentioned, the Advisory Council went along with those at the public hearing and endorsed the September season. I had concerns then. I still have concerns now that <clears throat> The moose hunt had gone so well for so many years that moving it back to September might create a conflict with uh, those folks who are not moose hunting. The last week in September, of course, is the peak of the fall trout and salmon fishing, and there are a great many folks out in the woods enjoying the foliage at that time of year. Uh, very frankly, very few people went to last year's moose hunt season public hearing. Like I mentioned, only a dozen people showed up. Uh, I don't think that'll be the case in the future. I think we'll see uh, more hunters take part in these hearings, and I think we'll begin to see more people who are not moose hunters come in and take part in these hearings because uh, moose hunters are not the only people affected by when we have the hunt. Typically, uh, my mail on this year's hunt ran uh, very much against the timing of it, and I got letters from folks who I uh, feel that we're very much in the same business with, and that's that's the Greenville Chamber of Commerce, the Rangeley Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber in Millinocket. Uh, they, they're real supporters of fish and wildlife and, and hunting and fishing in that part of the state is certainly big business. Their concerns were that by having the hunt in September there was a, a conflict uh, between, not a direct conflict, head-to-head -head conflict between hunters and fishermen, but uh, the fishermen were out there, the leaf peepers were out there, and there was just no need to have the moose season then. If we just wait until the first week in October, Fishing season's over, <clears throat> October is regarded as, as hunting season, and we, we can avoid this conflict, which in my view was unnecessary. There's no need to, to have the moose hunting that last week in September. So <clears throat> as we begin to go through the process of setting this season and others, uh, I think we'll begin to see people other than hunters uh, taking yeah. a part in the decision-making process. It goes right back to uh, the first statements right. on the program when you pointed out that fishermen and hunters aren't the only people that have a right to observe and to enjoy this resource. That's right. And uh, well, and also, uh, and I have to agree too, you know, that last week of fishing season for fly fishing, I think of the roach, for example. Yeah, that's a uh, good example. Uh, you know, and I'm sure that's perfectly all right. You and I go fishing down there and take our chances, I'm mm -hmm. sure, but uh, to think there might be an accident and somebody would fire at a moose and, and uh, a human being would be the victim would be really tragic. And it isn't just a safety issue. Uh, there is there is somewhat of a conflict, I think, between 
you know, having a moose season open at that time. Uh, and it isn't entirely a safety issue. I get letters from folks who say, we enjoy coming to Maine to see a moose. Oh, we, just, we just don't want to see it in the back oh. of a pickup truck. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And that, that's the kind absolutely. of conflict I'm talking about. Absolutely. When, uh, the, the season has gone very well. We're very pleased with the way it goes. And, and I think by moving it into October, we can avoid that, that sort of a conflict. You are leading me around to my question. You're not going to increase the number of permits, are you? I don't have the authority. I know you don't, <laughs> but are uh, you going to support <clears throat> I don't think it'll be an issue this year. I certainly supported it the last time it came out. I know you did. I would like very much for the department to have the authority to adjust uh, the number of permits based on an annual census. And we don't have that now. We're limited to a thousand. A thousand uh, in many years would be adequate. There may be other years when we'd like to increase that. So I, my argument really was to give management authority to the department, take it out of the hands of the legislature. And we came very close. We came within a couple of votes. So I know you did. So I think long, well, long I, I term. I think that's right. I think that's where the authority and the management uh, problems rest, right yeah. there. But uh, don't forget, we made a commitment to these people that went to referendum 10 years ago uh, that, uh, that would, this day would never happen when we'd go to increase to kill more moose and so forth. You know, it's a big, big treasure that we have here, mm -hmm. as you well know. And we're in the business of protecting it, and we certainly don't want to destroy it. But there, there are legitimate stewardship reasons why we want to have the authority in some years to take more moose than we're taking now. Uh, and that isn't because we're, again, uh, because we're callous or insensitive or we don't care about moose. I mean, we, we're, the, we're the, the guys who uh, are interested in protecting the moose. Uh, but a, a well-managed moose hunt is, although it's difficult to articulate to people, is important for the, for the overall health of the moose population. Oh, that's 100% and, true. And, and uh, I just think that we ought to have more management authority, and, and that is not necessarily to increase the harvest, to double it or triple it or whatever. But uh, right now we are limited to 1,000, and, and uh, frankly I don't know why the legislature wants to be continually making this decision. I, think, I would think that they'd be better off frankly, if, if we were making those decisions. The legislature decided uh, after the referendum <clears throat> that we would hunt moose. Now the question of where we hunt them, when we hunt them, and how many we take should be left up to the professionals. But you will agree the non-hunter, the people who, the photographer, uh, the nature walker, the hiker, and so forth, does have a share uh, of this resource Ab absolutely. to observe. Absolutely, absolutely they do. Well, had an interesting deer season just passed, and may I congratulate you and the department uh, for the safe hunting season that we had. Well, the credit it, for that goes to the hunters, there's no question. Well, that's true. Uh, that, they uh, did an outstanding job. This is the safest season we've ever had. I'm very proud of it. Were you disappointed in the kill? Well, it's a little lower than what we projected. Of course, we issued uh, 10,000 fewer doe permits. Uh, we were looking for a lower kill because last winter was, uh, in many parts of the state, was pretty rough on the deer herd, so we were trying to, to slow the kill down. Uh, so we're not surprised that it was less than last year. Uh, it's a little lower than our projections. I think Jerry, probably on your show, uh, talked about 27,000. Uh, when the final figures are in, I don't think we'll quite make that. But we expected it to be down, and we had hoped, of course, that the bear kill would come down as well, and that did. The deer kill, I think, uh, probably is a result of a number of factors. The fewer doe permits, and very frankly, the weather wasn't all that yep. good. If, if, you, if all you had to hunt uh, was Saturdays and Veterans Day, you took a beating. Veterans mm -hmm. Day uh, typically is a, is a day for a lot. And, and You know, in an early Thanksgiving, and I talked to any number of hunters who ordinarily take that week. Had Thanksgiving came the following Thursday, mm -hmm. uh, because that week was usually the week that they went to camp for the week, and they wanted to be back home with it, and so they elected not to hunt this year. Yeah. And uh, so that played a part in it too. And, you know, north of here with the heavy snows that mm -hmm. they had, and we had comparatively mild weather down here. A couple of days, the golf courses were actually busy, and it was right in the middle yeah. of the deer hunt. So. Uh, well, going into that last week of the season, in fact, uh, late the next to last week, uh, up there at Escor, there was over 40 inches of snow in the woods. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, there's about uh, a quarter of the state where the hunters were severely restricted because of deep snow. Yep, yep. Bill, what's ahead in the next few years? What do you hope to accomplish? Well, uh, 
the primary goal this winter is going to be to develop a, a, a real structured productive landowner relations program. Uh, as you and I have talked before, probably the, the future of hunting is uh, is not in doubt now, but what direction it goes in I think uh, is in doubt for a variety of reasons. <clears throat> but here in Maine, I, I think uh, the most important we can work we can do over the next year or so is, is to formally address uh, the issue of where are we going to be hunting. And it's pretty clear we're going to be hunting on private land in the future, but how are we going to encourage people who have already posted their land to open it up for public use, and how are we going to dis discourage the, the further posting of land. And it's got to come down to, to hunters like you and I dealing directly with the landowners, the small landowners, the farmers, as well as, as, the, as the corporate landowners, uh, to come up uh, with a program that will keep those lands open so you and I will have a place to hunt and our kids will have a place to hunt in the future. So that's going to be the primary focus over the next few months in addition to, to dealing with uh, what most everyone recognizes as some pretty difficult economic times and, and, uh, and budget constraints that we'll be operating under. So this winter I think is going to be a, going to be a tough one and you'll be getting your money's worth out of, out of us down in Augusta, I'm sure. Bill, how are you going to approach this? By neighborhood meetings, uh, town meetings, a group. The, the meeting? landowner program. Yes. Well, we've already been through that part of the process. We've uh, gone through the the assessment phase where we have involved farmers and and uh, other landowners and determine why they post their land, what what drove them to it to begin with, and what it would take to get them to open their lands up again. And and we've involved people from all sorts of user groups in this process, not just hunters, but snowmobilers, cross-country skiers, bird watchers, everyone who enjoys the use of, of uh, privately owned land. And we've identified some key areas there that uh, I think are going to help guide us in what direction we go to. Uh, we've got to do it because, like I've told you before, the, the, the real question in the future isn't going to be, a, are there enough deer to hunt? The question is going to be, is there a place to hunt? And that's what we've got to deal with. Bill Soffer, nice having you on the show. We've Thank been doing you, this now regularly once a year, and it's kind of nice to have you report to our viewers out there exactly your feelings and how the Fish and Game Department operates in the state of Maine. By all odds, it's one of the most successful departments that we have anywhere, and it measures up well when you contrast it to other states in America. For this night, I'm Bud Levitt, wishing you a good evening. Along the mountain track